come along, dear. Welcome to Show People, the podcast that shines a spotlight on the UK performing arts industry, covering the latest news, industry issues, what to see and do, and showcasing talent whilst always trying to inform, educate, and entertain. Hello, company. My name is Andrew Keats. I'm a director and your host. Go on, grab yourself a cuppa from the green room. Now, every episode... We seek out an exceptional artist from the performing arts world. However, this time, I've just turned up at my mate Steve's flat. He's one of the UK's finest comedians, with credits spanning West End musicals to feature films, much-loved television shows to those infamous orange ads. Please welcome to the show the brilliant Mr Steve Thirst! Welcome to the show, Steve! Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, coming up on today's show, Steve and I will be discussing West End ticket prices. Do you think they're outrageous or are they value for money? I'll be covering the latest dramatic news. There's music from composer Matthew Strachan performed by West End leading lady Kim Ismay. And of course, throughout the show, I'll be interviewing Steve all about his life, his career, and of course, setting him some infamous show people challenges too. You're listening to the Show People Podcast. Hello. Can I say already I'm completely enamoured with the professionalism of that beginning? Well, I do like a a good, firm opening. Yes, I know. Oh, I know. I know. We've worked together before. I know. You were all about the opening. But you've actually been on the past three Show People podcasts. But not not in person. Not in person, just a a voice from afar. A disemboweled voice. Disembodied. Disemboweled is obviously a... Very, it's very, very more painful. It's much more painful. It, it, oh, I know what it is. I remember now. Do you? Yeah. Let, For you. listeners at home that are wondering what on earth we are talking yes. about, this is the transition from our very, very first episode, and now people keep coming up to me and saying, Mr. Andrew Keats. Hello, this is Steve First, and you are listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. A man so marvellous... He's putting bums on seats. Whether it be parakeets eating halal meats or premier athletes submitting VAT receipts. It's the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. With With Andrew Andrew Keats. Keats. Thank you for doing that for me. You're welcome. Brilliant. And I didn't realise how much of a poet you are. Did you come up with anything else that rhymes with Keats? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Well, there's there's nothing like a rhyming dictionary. Those things exist. I do it online. Rhyme Rhyme zone. Rhyme zone. Amazing. Uh, what have you been up to? I'm preparing to get married, but the... Um, that little thing. I know, for the second time. But, but uh, I have been, I suppose in the spring, May, June, I was uh, filming a movie. And I always, I, I'm always very cautious about saying, this is, we've got magic here. It's about wrestling. We made a pilot of it six years ago. It's an ensemble cast. It's set in the north. It's it's about wrestling now. Um and it's just got a heart and it's funny and Stephen Graham's in it, Jill Halfpenny, Sue Johnston, um, Stephen Tonkinson, um, Julian Sands, an amazing cast. Sounds like a good old-fashioned British film like the old days. It really is. And it looks like a Wes Anderson film. Wow. And Dan, who's written and directed it, is it's his first feature film. And it Fox read it, loved it, and it said, well, there's five million to make it which is amazing for a first-time director. And I have to say, all the money was on screen. We were in the the worst trailers imaginable. But there's something about... It's like uh, working at the Royal Court on Favoured Nations, where you feel everyone's on the same money. And even if you've got a smaller part, because it's an ensemble cast, everyone's there every day. So it's not like, well, you're the star, you know, and... And woe betide anyone who would come on set and behave like that because it just, you'd feel very out of place doing that. It's not like, and one of the parts was was the last to be cast and they were talking to Russell Crowe about it and and it would have completely changed the dynamic of a film like this. And actually a a great, it's like doing a a good theatre show. You don't need to have a huge star name. I mean, I suppose in, in terms of marketing, it's it's a name on the poster. But if the product's great, word of mouth it, it was, is going to be enough to sell this uh, movie. And and the great thing about film is it will obviously it will have a theatrical release, but then it will live 
online. It will live on Netflix. Like a course. legacy, of course. Of course, yeah. There's a, there's a piece of advice I was given, which I swear by, which is now every show that I do and every either creative or cast member I work with, the advice I was given is, Andrew, whoever you give the job to, make sure it's the most exciting job for them there. Yeah. And since I've taken on that philosophy, you never get somebody that's uh, too tired or hungover to come into rehearsal. They're eager and they appreciate the work. And you just, like you said, you get that camaraderie and how nice and how British actually to hear about a film that has essentially a, a theatre company ethos. And it, f- and I'm, you know, okay, and I'm always like, oh, it was always like a family, but it really was genuine because yeah. Dan... It, it was where he grew up. So his mum was on set, his kids were on set, and and Stevie Graham's kids were in it. And, you know, it was having that that family vibe that makes... And, you know, it, it does change the working dynamic. Mm. And the, the, the lines are blurred between when you're on screen and acting, when you're off screen and just having banter. And actually, you know, we would... It, it, with the, the games we would come up with, it, we were in a pub for a week and just inventing these extraordinary, ridiculous games. And so it felt like you know, we were having as much fun off screen as, as on screen. And that, that's, I have to say, it is a rarity. So what's the film called and when's it coming out? Walk Like a Panther and it will be coming out, I think, early March. And we start, they start test screening in October. Amazing. And I've got my friend Guy Chambers to do the music and... Um, it, the provenance and the people, the, the editor is someone who's edited for 50 years. Um, he was Sam Peckinpah's editor. And every time Fox are watching a, a, a new edit, they are so enamoured with it. Wonderful. And it, it yeah, it's, again, I don't, I don't like saying it's going to be a hit, but it's probably going to be a hit. I've started a thing with the show People podcast because, mm-hmm. of course... You've never heard this yet because no no episodes have been released at the time of us recording this. Now, each episode, I try to find a creative way of finding out about all my guests' remarkable careers in the form of a show people challenge. Okay. Now, it would be fair to say that I think we could probably release your CV in paperback form because there are just (laughs) so many credits. Um, And previously, I've had artists try to remember all of their credits and recite it in one minute. (laughs) And thanks to doing that, we nearly killed Annette Badland, oh, God, national yeah, well, treasure. And I'm not surprised, yeah. So, of course, you're, you're a bloody good friend of mine. I've known you for a long time. We've worked together. I wouldn't make you go through all of that rigmarole. But instead, mm-hmm. I've taken a page from the actor studio. And I don't know if you've seen when they go, uh, uh, can, I talk to, uh, can I talk to that character? <laughs> and I thought, yeah. if I've got you on the show... <laughs> Who would be the greatest character to sum up your entire CV? And I, of course, thought Mr. Lenny Beige. Yes, I suppose so. So late last night, I've yeah. created uh, what, what I think is, is sufficiently beige music. You have just over two minutes because I've learned, you know, when I've got some of the youngins on, a minute is OK. But you're going to have two minutes with special music I want to hear your entire CV as a countdown from Lenny Beige, starting now. The actor Steve First. Well, he's been around, let me tell you. Um, when he started uh, me a whippersnapper, he was knee-high to a Corbett. Um, he, uh, his first uh, TV credit was actually a Lexi sales merry-go-round where he played uh, an IRA uh, homosexual um, <laughs> who had to say, I'll march through your area. Um, he um, then went on to uh, uh, dizzying heights. He appeared in many, many sitcoms. Uh, My Dad's Prime Minister. Um, uh, he, uh, Alistair McGowan's uh, European uh, special. Um, uh, he was in Dick and Dom uh, playing Manitol the Wizard. Wonderful show. Three series, cruelly <laughs> axed um, at its zenith. Uh, Should have got a BAFTA, but didn't. Um, uh, Little Britain, three series of that. Yep, uh, I was the man that literally said nothing, but also, um, well, I mean, I say I was the man. It was Steve, and he was in the uh, 
the sketch which is voted the greatest sketch of all time, the swimming pool sketch. Um, he uh, appeared, uh, well, uh, as Lenny Beige, three series for BBC uh, called Lenny Beige's Variety Pack, a Channel 4 special. Um, he was on stage, uh, Mr. Wormwood. He played uh, Mr. Wormwood in Matilda. 600 performances. 600 performances. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. Um, uh, made in Dagenham, the original cast, where he played Thule, the boss of Ford. Um, he was in a lovely little two-hander at the Arts Theatre uh, before the, the King's Head called Wet Weather Cover with Michael Brandon. Uh, amazing play written by Mr. Oliver Cotton. Uh, there are so many. Uh, recently, Doc Martin. Um, uh, uh, do you know what? It's embarrassing to even list anymore. <laughs> I mean, I could. But 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds. Um, I would say, and then there's the one-man shows. There's the touring shows. There's the, uh, the, the in-character show. There's behind-the-net curtains. There was 12 Angry Men. That was in Edinburgh. That sold out. We're even talking about bringing that back next year Maybe with no. the same cast. Uh, 10 seconds left. 10 seconds. Let's just take time to contemplate what I've said in those 10 seconds. Luxuriate in the career of Steve First. That was Do you know, I think you might be the best at that challenge so far. It's weird because I, I started, because I, I always edited my show reels. So I was thinking about the show reels and then you go, <laughs> oh my God, of course there was that one and there was that one, but you can never remember the bloody names of the shows. The, uh, the thing that makes me laugh though is when, this is why I, Fra Fee in the last episode, uh, by working in musical theatre, really has quite a strong reaction to background music. So Fra forgot he was in, you know, the film version of Les Miserables, you know, that, that tiny <laughs> that, version. That little, yeah, yeah. That, Kasky Jansen yeah. forgot that she went <clears throat> to a many a chocolate factory. Uh, so let's have a little look. Uh, tell me a little bit about Friday Night Dinner. Uh, well, Which you're obviously best known for. The thing is, I've because I've done so many, like, single episodes, you know, where you just... <clears throat> and I really... That, that, that's a kind of, it's an odd curse because you kind of, you, you love to work, but when you're on something just for an episode or you're doing three, four days, you never get the, you, you kind of, you start to get comfortable and then you're off. Yeah. And you're in someone's family, ostensibly, and with something like Friday Night Dinner, it's a family and it's great, but then you kind of go, oh, well, that's it, see ya, bye. Um, they're bringing it back next year. I play Tracy Ann Oberman's husband. And I hope, you know, they. you always hope to get a return gig. They happen very rarely. Oh, I was in uh, Toast. Yeah, you right were. Cockaboo. Well, friend Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so those single ep things you do forget about. But then things like Dick and Dom, which was three series, and it was a joyous thing. And I remember every theatre show because I was yeah. in it from beginning to end. So those, those are the things that are entrenched in your memory. I think the big thing that I said to you when we first got to know each other... And it was really, really interesting how, when I thought of Steve First, Steve First was Steve First, the actor. And then as we got to know each other, realising, oh, but you get that strange... And of course, it's all empirical. It's people liking to put people in boxes. Mm -hmm. But it was that strange thing of other people going, actor, no, he's the comedian. And the strange thing that people have of putting people in a box, so you, you can't do both. Yet, in my a, mind... It is a curse. And it's, led... Yeah, there's a thing about Brits and having a mistrust of... I remember when, you know, I'd go and see people trying to get an agent. And they go, well, what do you do with your cabaret? Well, we don't really know what to do with that. And then, oh, you do a bit of music and you, mm, that's not really our department. And you do a bit of radio. And mm, well. when I was with Curtis Brown for years, it was like, we're only going to look after you for acting. And so everything else I was having to do myself and yeah. they'd come and see my cabaret. But, and then you'd go and have a meeting with an agent in America and they go, well, this is just, well, you do everything else. Brilliant. They just see money across a whole raft of platforms. The thing we're both very similar about is you just create and have sustained so many things that have come just from you having an idea and getting up and going, I'm going to do that. So for anybody listening and wondering, why did Andrew, what did he say? Something about a Lenny Beige? What is that? Perhaps uh, you'd like to tell everyone about some of the, the characters that you've created and the, the live cabarets that you've been running for years. Well, Lenny's, Lenny's weird because Lenny is like living with a, a, a partner that I, because I created Lenny in 95 and he was a cabaret character and I was promoting clubs and I want, always wanted to run a, a nightclub that was like the clubs you'd see in 60s films. And eventually we did. We had the most successful cabaret club in London. It was 500 people every week. And Robbie Williams used to, to perform there and All Saints and, you know, Chaz and Dave and Wogan. I mean, it was incredible. <laughs> That's the first time ever you're going to hear <coughs> Robbie Williams, All Saints uh, Chaz and, and, and Chaz and Dave. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> but it was a kind of club where anything happened and, 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 and everything did. And it, there were magical times. But 
And I still, and I've never been able to leave Lenny. I, I, I st- you know, I'm still, I'm doing the best work I've ever done as Lenny now. And I do my, the new, new show's Neil Diamond tribute. And finally, I, I'm singing songs in a, a range that is comfortable to me because I'm a baritone and singing songs is difficult for me because everything, everything you want to sing is really high. And so I, I all, I've always come back to Lenny. And then, but in the, in the meantime, I was doing, other characters and I used to have a club called Probe that was an improvised chat show so I would bring three new characters and I wouldn't know what the host was going to ask me and that way you went that character works that's got legs and then I take that away flesh it out and then that then became the show you directed with me which was five monologues and they're they're more dramatic than they used to be they're more like well, you did Bennett. get me to direct it, love. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here's a dollar. And it, it and it was that thing of not being afraid of not having laughs after doing Lenny, mm. which is is all about laughs. And and it's a really, I think the older I've got them, I, I I'm a late developer. I'm a really am a late developer, and I only now feel comf, com, confident in my ability. And it's taken a long time, and better late than never. But it means that. I embrace the darkness and I love making people laugh and then cutting it dead and just sitting there and waiting for the silence to, you know. And I, I, I used to panic when I'd do the character shows before. I'd have to get laughs all the time. And, mm. and now there aren't many people doing those sort of shows which you don't know whether to laugh or cry or, you know. And I think it's, that's a very British thing and I love that and I think I want to I will, I'll, I'll always come and, you know, with the character show, you can kind of introduce new ones or take out old ones. And it's great. And we did, we made the decision not to go off and change. Yeah. I used to have video between all of my characters. And, and there was something really very different about that, where people would see me change on stage. And it, it made such, psychologically, where people would see a transformation. And, you know, I mean, fuck, it's just putting on a wig and turning around and having a different gait. Well, or a that's, that's wall. underestimating what, what what you did. I mean, the first thing I said to you when when you sent me the first drafts of the of the monologues was, Steve, you're an extraordinary writer. And I think in the performance, it was interesting when we were in rehearsal, just playing the truth and knowing the technique and yeah. looking at physicality and yeah. just speaking to you. I suppose like I talk to any other actor, rather than perhaps I can imagine how easy that show could have been just played for laughs. But yeah. you know as well as I know, something is only funny if it's truthful. Well, it's funny because when I used to do it, when I did, because, you know, a few of these characters I did, did 15 years ago, and I wanted to revisit them with the armour, the armoury that I've got now, Yeah, having been in shows forever. And I just went, I need to revisit them and do them justice. But it was having, and I never had a director. I would just, you'd write them and then you'd learn it and then you'd stand on stage and just deliver it. And it was having, and you go, no, 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 it, it's a theatre piece. Yeah. And even if it's one man or 50 people, it still has to, you still have to have someone to bounce off, to go, well, that could be improved by just just simple things. And having, you know, as a director, you have devices that you can use and they are really simple, but you, I haven't had a training. And that I've always felt... Uh, Envious of people who have because they do. That's what drama school teaches you, you know. It, and I and not having had that, and I've learned on my feet in stand up. So I'm really sharp, and I and I love when I can just bang, come out of, in the, or improvise in character, and people are like, "Whoa, that's amazing!" You're like, "Well, that's the stand up training. The other stuff has to be learnt by people who are schooled in theatre, and mm. it's often very simple devices. But my God, it works." Hello, my dears. You have the ineffable and probably undeserved pleasure of listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. This is Stephen Fry wishing you a wonderful listen. Thank you. So this is the part of the show uh, where I ask my guest about whether they have any axes to grind. <laughs> and before today's show, I asked Steve what he would like to do. Steve, what are we going to be moaning about today? I pride myself on not being uh, someone who just slags off stuff for the sake of it. And I made a decision a few years ago. I'm not just going to... It's too easy. And you can be very creative and very funny when you're being negative. But there are certain things. And I had a my stepfather, who's American and a musician, and we had a, a very heated discussion when tickets went on sale for Hamilton. 
and uh, and I just it just suddenly I just got very just incandescent with rage at the hike in ticket prices, which I can only um, say is because here comes a blockbuster. So we can now charge blockbuster prices. And it seemed to me this is the way it's gone for the last five, that these event shows can pretty much charge, because pop music's been doing it for years, what they like. As soon as you put it in a no two thing and it becomes corporate. And for me, it's obviously a great show and it's a big cast. And I've, we've all worked with big casts. And I, my gripe is, is that the people who own the theatres, the, you know, the Camerons and the Lloyd Webbers, and they do have a, a rent and a, you know, a, 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 that's set in stone. You have to, there's a break even point. I get that. What I don't get and what I don't appreciate is that this spurious kind of, well, we're going to do VIP tickets now as well. So you get a box of Maltesers and you get a signed programme and, and we can charge you an extra 50 quid. And it just seems to me not about the show but about um, an event. And I'm, I'm going to pause there because as you're talking, I'm very much aware that your gorgeous dark is just drinking from the water bowl, but I suspect that anybody listening to this is just going to think that you're wanking. <laughs> that's all. Well, that's always what I do. In any interview, I always... I, I, you know, uh, yeah, there's nothing like pleasure in <laughs> I'm going to listen to that. I was having a heated discussion with my stepfather, who's American, he's a musician, um, at the time when the Hamilton booking were, and the whole frenzy of, you know, people online and clogging up the the, uh, the website. And, and I just suddenly thought, you know what? You, you've now invented a new tier of ticket price that just seems to be based solely on the fact you know you've got a hit. You know you're going to sell whatever price you put because the, the, the it's already the stuff of myth and for me i just felt that you know yeah the, oh you can do daily returns you can do that you can do that but the box standard stalls ticket price as soon as you hit over 100 quid no my gripe is if that's shared equally amongst especially amongst the ensemble great but it never is they don't get any more this year than they were getting 10 years ago. They're getting less and they have to live further out because they can't afford to live in London. So everyone is travelling further. It's more expensive. And I just think we're all down on the deal. And yet you are... You have, for me, you have the temerity to, to charge this amount. And when it's... And it's doubly worse when it's people who are producing who own the theatre as well. You're like... Well, you, you, you are fucking own this. This is you're not having to go and do up an, an empty building and and pay ground rent to somebody like you do with a festival. I find the whole VIP ticket thing disgusting. The, well, you can come and you can get a, a you know you can sit in the room and maybe uh, you can touch one of the cast members <laughs> and you can smell the underpants ones worn by you. And I just think you know these little kind of it's like when you go and meet you do the meet and greet at, at the Justin Timberlake concert and they literally walk through a room and you get handed an eight by ten and you've be, be paid an extra five hundred dollars for that and you know that people will still pay it and yet the experience you get it's not about the experience you're getting sat in the theatre watching it's you're selling something else that is no as far as i'm concerned there's no place in in the, this world i think but if it if it made a difference and we all had the share of that great but it doesn't and i just think it's an arrogance and and unfortunately they've set the bar now even higher and it allows the next show to do that. And then so it goes on and spirals and spirals. I mean, even if it's just a, a you know, I mean, I think, you know, paying 80 quid for a stall seat for, for uh, a show at the Gilgood or whatever is, you've, you've got to know it's a five-star show to book it. Which probably makes a lot of the programming less diverse, less interesting. I mean, my mother and uh, sister, both very, very working class background, uh, still live in their ex-council house in Dorset and they there are times when they have said to me Andrew we can't afford to come and see one of your shows yeah uh, and that's really really sad yes I understand capitalism works but I really respect the 
the theatres that will have an allocation of tickets at uh, the National Theatre, for example, with their Travelex scheme. Well, so, I mean, where... a subsidised theatre can afford to do that. Exactly. Well, it, well that, I suppose that's the, the Royal problem. Court also to sponsor theatre. You know, there are... There are an, uh, Listen, and I'm not saying that. I mean, thank God, because I think the, the knock-on effect of that is the proliferation of uh, off West End, off, off West End shows. You know, Southwark, um, uh, all of those. You know, even Tabard or whatever. I mean, there are there are there are a lot of great actors that are that are working in in smaller theatres because they they have to. Um, and another gripe is that when you're charging top dollar f- for sitting in. Theatres that don't have air conditioning, that you know, that are very uncomfortable. That I just, it's you pick and choose. Therefore, what you're going to go and see. And I, I, I know people have got to make money, and you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know what the answer is. And I, you know, I would love. I just think someone's making a lot of money, and we see how much those tiny percentage of people like Cameron or whatever are now he's a billionaire and he's, you know, and you go, but there needs to be, I think the money needs to find its way back to um, the people in the form of more uh, offers and cheaper tickets and not sticking them up in the gods of actually being able to sit in good seats. Why should just because you're poorer have to sit and, and see Tiny little pin dot people moving around. Well, the other hysterical thing, that there's one particular show in town uh, which is famously in a very tricky theatre and because of the production you have restricted views and I think it stinks that that you've got families uh, who are looking for the cheapest ticket and it's coming up at something like 60 quid to sit in a seat where there's a giant column yeah. in the middle of yeah, yeah. what they're watching i mean that can't be fair i mean listen you are you you're going to a victorian theater and there are there are buildings with columns and that you know but, but you need to quid, charge a lot less for those yeah 60 quid to look through a column um you know the thing is when i was in matilda and i was very very aware of of the ticket prices and also as a member of the cast who were given two free tickets for the whole run and then we'll do house seats. But because it was a sellout show, there was no concession for house seats. And it's like, my kids have now got to pay full price to sit. And that, it just, it really riles. Or if there are empty seats, when I was doing Dagenham, no, we're not, we're still going to charge full price. And it, 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 at every level, you just think it's greed, it's greed, it's greed. And I, you want word of mouth to spread about this? Well, if you've got empty seats, fill them, fill them. Get people talking about it, and uh, you know, I, 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 it, I don't want to. I don't want to be the, the old man in the corner just going meh. But conversely, when I was on stage and you realise that people have paid eighty quid and there's a family of five people, that's their one trip a year. So my God, you don't phone it in. You absolutely make sure you do an amazing show, and that. That wasn't like in Edinburgh where you kind of went, well, you know, people have only paid this. So you kind of, people are a bit hungover when you do a show and, you you know, it was a bit shabby. I'm glad to say that people are aware of the the price that people have paid and will therefore give them a, a, a fucking great show. I think it's interesting as well when you take, uh, say, artists that are releasing their albums on iTunes and you pay, what, seven ninety nine, ten ninety nine. 99 When you pay that, for an artist, of course, if they have a dud album, you don't find yourself saying, well, I am never going to listen to no. her again. You just go, oh, that was a bit rubbish, but then you'll buy the next album because the, the investment isn't so large. My concern is if someone's going to the theatre for the very first time, you know, to see their first play or their first West End musical, and that family pays, as you were saying, you know, three, four hundred quid to take the whole family, and it's rubbish. Yeah. I think that... People will have the perspective of, well, theatre's rubbish. It well, costs too much. And I wonder, are they going to come back? Well, I don't gonna- know, because there are enough shows that you and I both seen that you go, God, this is pants, but it's full <laughs> every night, mamma mia. But you know what I mean? I mean, there are ones that you just go, and I understand why they love it, but it does feel like, God, they're treading water. They've been doing it for 15 years, and it's, just, you know. But then you will go and see a Billy Elliot, which has been was on for 10 years, and you go, they're still just knocking it out of the park yeah. every night. So, you know, there are, I, I, in answer to your question, I do think that, the, the, that people will go and see a show that's, a, or a jukebox musical that's a bit 
it's a bit lackluster, but people have that they know what they're getting. They don't want to go and see something that's extraordinary or challenging or whatever. So, you know, they've probably had a great night uh, and they will come back and see something else similar. I think those people that see those shows that come in on buses, that's what they want. I think it was, uh, not, I may be wrong, so listeners, please do correct me, but I was told many years ago when I was at drama school that actually the, the, the ticket hiking started when the American production of A Chorus Line came over. And the reason being is when they shifted everything over to, to the West End, that big American extraordinary musical was coming over, the Americans, of course, charged more, yeah. um, not necessarily knowing the West End market. And all of the other theatres went, hang on a sec, A Chorus Line is selling out and they're charging you know, the, these huge prices and the rest of the western went well if they can do it we can do it and it seems ticket prices have escalated this is what i'm saying as soon as you've shifted the bar and got away with it then then it's fine then it's fair game and that's that's the problem and and i can't see how there'll be a reversal of that anymore and my stepdad was like yeah, but that's capitalism that's how it works and i'm like i understand that's how it works but it's not right you know, and and I uh, and I unfortunately I just I mean look th- th- like I said, what it's meant is smaller theatres doing great work, Arcola, you know, Arcola, whatever, and and those are places that are really they're they're, they're doing well, and the Park Theatre and and it's great that those places exist, and there's more, far more of those theatres than there were twenty years ago, ten years ago. I mean, it just it, there is an off West End scene now. I mean, it's. You know, there's probably 20 theatres you can go and see a show for 20 quid. It's interesting when I've produced those kinds of shows, when I will get audience members come up to me and go, you could get away with charging 40, 50 pounds for this show. And you say, well, we may be able to do that, but then we're just going to get a very certain demographic. Exactly. That middle class uh, money is no object. You mentioned the tabard. I remember doing uh, Stars and Drews just so there when I was much younger. And knowing that a lot of the kids that were coming to see that really magical musical, it was their first production. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's the kids. It's like, that's why, and I know you've done a lot of pantos. It's the kids that go to the pantos that's and the children's the first shows. first taste, yeah. But they're the kids, I think, in 20 years' time who are going to be going to the National, who understand the, the beauty of these, these buildings and these, these extraordinary shows. Well, you know, it was the, um, our mutual friend, Danielle Torrento, who's made it, I mean, her career has been doing those off West End shows with huge success. And she, at every opportunity, she said, I'm, I don't want to get any bigger. It's like people I know who own restaurants that have got 40, 50 covers. And they're like, as soon as I increase that and get greedy, then I'm losing the control of it. Then there's the whole, there's a whole raft of problems that come by by going into a West End theatre in terms of having to deal with bigger marketing, with the politics of of, uh, of a theatre group. That I mean, all of that. So I have a huge amount of respect for people that that want to do that aren't greedy and that are making a living from it, but could make a greater living doing West End, but could also in one show their career could be over because they could lose everything. So so what do you think, listeners? Please get in touch. Uh, you can tweet me using the handle at Andrew Keats. Tweet the show using at Show People UK and use the hashtag Show People Podcast. Um, you can also send me an email to info at arian-productions.com or via the Show People Facebook page at facebook.com slash show people podcast. Hi, this is David Bedella, and you're listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. Oh, that oh, voice. But, uh, my love, I have, I'm slightly obsessed by Bedella, but um, he, uh, <laughs> when, I was doing, when I was hosting the What's On Stage Awards, I just remember him. He was just about to walk on stage to do a bit of a, a Sweeney Todd, maybe. And, uh, so, yeah, and as, he, as he walked on stage, he just, he just went, hey, Steve. Hold my change, <laughs> and uh, and I just had this, 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 and then he forgot that I was holding his change, so I went to the bar. <laughs> Bedella, tell me about you growing up. Where are you from, and what was a, a young Steve first like before you got so riled and bitter and twisted and became the man you are now? Well, I grew up in a, in a I, I wouldn't say rarefied, but my my father was a conductor, my stepfather was a famous cellist, and so I grew up in a classical music background and. Uh, so it was very quiet at home and quite uh, cerebral and, and I played instruments, but I knew I wasn't going to be, I wasn't good enough to be a 
professional fiddle player or whatever. Professional fiddler. Yes. <laughs> um, however, I always had designs on being a performer, but I was painfully shy, and I and I I just I never I didn't I really didn't perform very much, and and then I found myself doing a drama degree, and uh, but just asking about really, it wasn't a vocational degree at all, and where was at, that in Winchester, and it was great fun, but it really didn't teach me much at all. Just you know, did a few shows, did a bit of comedy, left. Started doing. I, I, I ran a comedy magazine and because I was obsessed, always obsessed by comedy, and wanted to start doing stand up. And I did. And I, I was never, I was never a great stand up, but I, uh, I just wasn't comfortable being me on stage. And then, I, th- I started doing Lenny Beige in the mid nineties, and that was. I just thought, I prefer being somebody else. And, and after having success as Lenny and I would go up for castings and I just, I just thought, shit, I'm not good enough. I wasn't, just, I found it, it, it was, I was a, it took a long time for me to start working. And I was lucky in that I knew Matt and Dave and started doing Little Britain, but it was by association. So I never felt growing up that, you know, I talked to people like you or Walliams or, you know, people who would do NYT and all of these things. And, you know, those were the show off kids. I I just never had that. And so my upbringing was more, I I was obsessed by going to the theatre and I used to bunk off school and go to the National and see matinees and, and, and I, and I wrote to Simon Callow when I was a kid and I devoured his book and, so I always knew that it was a world that I wanted to go into, but I I just didn't have the confidence. And also I didn't have the didn't have somebody pushing me, even though my parents were performers. They always supported me doing what I did. They and they still do and they love what I do. But so I I just kind of felt I was floundering really as a I was a, quite a loner and uh, hearing the voices in my head, but never being able to channel it and doing the school play and doing that. I, we didn't really have drama at school. You know, and I, uh, I wish I did. And now my kids, you know, my son is, you know, first audition he did, he was at the old Vic, and I'm like, <laughs> you prick! I'm not, still not worked at the old Vic. I just reminded the listeners how old Max is now. He's now thirteen, but he was seven, and eight when he did that. <laughs> and but you know, what? It's, it's so it's so funny because now I can see their talent, and they do voiceovers and stuff. And it's, I know how to recommend what they should do or where they should go or that you know my my parents just were in this very removed classical world that just they had very little knowledge of what I was into where did you hone those those early skills where did you get the opportunity to practice your craft I didn't until I was an adult and that was by getting up and doing it I realized my first genuine skill because I used to run a comedy night and it was comparing and I knew my skill lay in just chatting to people on stage. And I was never very good at just writing material and gags, but really good at improvising with. And so when I started doing Lenny, who was a compare, that was my natural forte. And even now, weirdly, something I've fallen into doing now is art auctions, charity auctions, because I'm really good at getting money out of people because you do it in a way that isn't aggressive and, but it's funny and putting people at their ease and chatting and people are much more amenable. As you know, you have to fundraise all the time. If you have to find nicer ways of doing it, gentler Mm. ways, um, more surreptitious, more softly, softly approach. People don't like a hard sell. We, you know, you see charity um, people in the street, we run away. You don't want that. Can I, I want some money. You know, you just, you need to make people comfortable and do them a soft sell and, you know, I think that's that, uh, kind of... I've always been a kind compare as well, and I think that's... that. I like to think that's reflective of who I am. Well, Steve is right. A kind approach to raising money. Um, please, uh, to follow on from that... Uh, it Just give be, me your fucking money! <laughs> as you'll know, this podcast uh, is available free of charge as an opportunity for those of you to learn about your craft, whether you're time poor or financially poor. But if you do have a spare fiver or five grand, I don't mind, please, <laughs> do, uh, please do help us by visiting www.arian-productions.com forward slash donate. 
Hi, this is Annette Badland, and you're listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. Well, Steve, it's now got to that part of the show. Do which... I get undressed now? Well, uh, no? no. Okay, okay, fine. N- not till yeah. later. All right. You know, well, you know, it's still recording. The bubble bath is running. It's now time for one of my favourite parts of the show that I like to call dramatic news. <laughs> Today's top stories. If you listened to the very first Show People podcast, you would have heard that Cassidy Jansen had some rather big news. Well, we can finally tell you what it is. Cassidy Jansen will join Beverly Knight and Amber Riley in a new musical supergroup called The Leading Ladies. They'll release a brand new album called Songs from the Stage, which will feature show tunes from the likes of Cats, Rent, Memphis and The Bodyguard. The King's Head Theatre has announced that two of its productions will transfer to the West End's Trafalgar Studios this winter. Puccini's opera La Boheme, adapted for the stage by King's Head artistic director Adam Spreby Mayer and Becca Marriott, and the play Strangers in Between by Australian writer Tommy Murphy about a young gay man fleeing his provincial home in Australia to search for acceptance in metropolitan Sydney. La Boheme will run at Trafalgar Studios from the 6th of December to the 6th of January 2018, and Strangers in Between will run from the 10th of January to the 3rd of February 2018. And 18. Nigel Havers, Dennis Lawson, and Stephen Tompkinson have been cast in a new tour of Yasmina Reza's comedy, Art, directed by Eddie Jones. The play, translated by Christopher Hampton, recently ran at the Old Vic in London. However, a new touring production, produced by David Pugh and Daphne Rogers, will open in February 2018. The production opens at the Cambridge Arts Theatre on February 14th, before setting out on a tour until June the 9th, 2018. Dates and a venue have been confirmed for the long-awaited musical Tina, based on the life of legendary singer Tina Turner. The musical will run at the Old Witch Theatre from the 21st of March, with an official opening night on the 17th of April. It is initially booking until the 16th of June 2018, and tickets will go on sale from 10am on the 22nd of September. Tina is written by Katori Hall, with Frank Ketela and Keith Prince, and will be directed by Phyllida Lloyd, who directed Mamma Mia!, And our final story, the Show People podcast is delighted to announce that after just over two weeks since our launch, we have received over 1,000 downloads and the number is rising. Thank you to everyone for listening. If you would like to send us a press release about a newsworthy story or perhaps you'd like to send us a recording telling us all about your next upcoming show, please just email info at arian-productions.com and we'll do our best to share with our listeners. Hi, this is Robert Duncan McNeil, and you're listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. Oh, I like the way he did the Andrew Keats. Very musical, is Robert yeah, Duncan McNeil. Andrew Keats. He, uh, he, when we were first getting to know each other, uh, I was, as I do, the homosexual that I am, humming uh, a bit of Into the Woods. And he looked at me and he went, what was that? And I went, oh, it, you won't know it. Oh, it's a, a musical called Into the Woods. He went... I was Jack. Oh, nice. And he yeah, was yeah. thrilled. Yeah. So let's look at entering the business. Let's look at that, that, that time when you arrive and you go, I've got bills, I have to pay. Yeah. What, yeah. Were, those, what were those early jobs? How did, how did you start professionally? You know, I, I, it's, I'm not, I don't boast about, but I've only ever had one job, one paid job, um, which was when I left college and I worked at... Uh, it was BSB, which was the uh, alternative to Sky. It had the square reel. We had the, the music channel. We ran the music channel. And it was like children being left in charge of a TV studio. And it was great. And, you know, Boy George was there and Suggs and um, Joe Wiley. It was an amazing panoply of talent there. And, um, and that was the only job I've ever had. I mean, you know, since then I've, I went, I started promoting clubs. I did a bit of DJing. I started doing a bit of stand up, and 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 of course there have been fallow times and successful times. But my God, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't know if it's luck, but I've I, I've always worked, and uh, I'm very very grateful. I've never had to wait tables, and I've never had to. Um, yeah, just do something that I just don't want to do. And we all know people that are constantly having to do that. I mean, especially working in theatre where, you know, after, you know, when I, you know, all the front of house people are doing it because they're waiting for their, their next job. And, you know, I just, 
thank God I haven't had to. And I, you know, I've got, I've, I've got child support. I mean, I've, I have to make money and I've always done voiceovers. Thank God. It's kept the wolf from the door for many years. I, I'm not hugely successful doing it, but I've earned enough, which has thankfully meant in the times that I'm not in a show, um, it's pocket money. It's enough to live. When was the point in your life where you felt, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm now established. I'm the Steve First now that, that casting directors go, oh, Steve First, of course I know him. What was the turning point, do you think, in those early days? Well, it was two, one when I was Lenny Beige and it was big and I was having meetings and I had a TV series. So that I thought I've arrived. That's I was 30 and it was like, well, that's it. That's me done. And then actually we, we, we were dropped and it, because the new head of the channel came in and as often happens, they get rid of whatever is and they need to make their own, stamp their own identity on a channel. So you're bitter at the time, but you know, and now I know why that happens. And then, uh, and then I think it's it, probably five years ago, really, where I think now people know who I am or casting directors know who I am. And I know that this film will finally be something that opens me as an actor up to a, a wider audience, but also a lot of casting people who haven't seen me for years. Because when you're Flavour of the Month and you you're in a load of sitcoms and then you're out of playing that age range and then you go, shit, I haven't seen them for five years, six years. And they, they don't forget who you are, but then you, you're aware that this whole raft of new people come that are the ones they go to. And also because I don't look my age, I go up for parts for people who are 45 to 50 and I'm going up against people who look much older than me. So, of course, they're going to... It's not about ability, it's about what you look like and do you visually fit that role? You know, everybody in the room can act. You know, you, you, there are casting directors who will only see you because you're good, but you go, I, I'm not going to get this. And it's not that I doubt my ability, it's just that physically. So it, that weirdly has been a curse because I do look a lot younger than I am. It's funny you say that, the, the tenacity of an actor, I'm sure particularly when it comes to men, uh, really pays dividends because I'm, I'm 100% certain that all of the very best roles in, in musical theatre and, and, and contemporary drama, I'm 100% convinced all of those roles are brilliant once you get to that 40, 50 age bracket because then you don't have to worry about being the slightly wet uh, leading man. It's the curse of the leading man, I think, because unless you're a superstar, which you'll always have a career, but those Guys and, and and women, of course, but you, but you know who shine brightly as the leading person between twenty five and thirty five, and then you're going to go. You off, you know. You're kind of just in this weird nether world of not. Re- or you know, maybe you're going to tour, but then if you've got a family, you can't. I mean, you know, the curse of it. It's a really tough ten, fifteen years, and also because I'm not a musical theatre person. Doing Matilda, I found myself doing the the comedy role. And singing a patter song. So suddenly I'm going up for lots of those. And that is a really rich vein. You go, I could be doing this now for 20 years. Like Nigel Planer was case in point. You know, you can do a narrator role, you can do the dad, or you, you're, you're not having to sing a huge song and belt it out of the, the theatre. You can, if you can hold a tune and you can do it in character, then there's always a role for you. Usually, there's usually a role for you in one of those shows. Now, you said earlier, you've obviously been, been married before and you have two wonderful, gorgeous children. Uh, well, teenagers now. Teenagers, yeah. um, Tell me, how do you, as a father, how do you survive in these mad industries and raise a family? What, what coping mechanisms Oh, I can't do you claim to have raised a family because that's my, my ex-wife, Wendy, and, and the, you know, she, she, she is the mum, so it's, they raise the kids. I have them twice a week. However, what you, they are in a world where both sets of, you know, but the, my, I'm an actor and her, she is and her husband is and... So they're aware of this weird, strange world. When I was doing Matilda, every Friday they would come to the theatre because I always had them on a Friday night. And so they... uh, I think their life is richer because of the people that they've met. Mm. And it's... But I'm also very aware of, like, you can't go to the playground and 
say, oh, my dad does this and my dad does that, because you're different then. You don't want your kid to be different. You want them to be part of... And they go to state school and they've always gone to state school, which I'm passionate about. I don't believe you need to send your kid to private school. And, you know, I don't want to get that debate about, oh, well, you know, privileged actors. But, you know, they know they're privileged. They live in North London. They have parents who work and they live in nice houses. And, you know, they're not rich, but... They are rich in terms of the people and the milieu that that we exist in. And I love the upbringing they've had as as a result because they, you know, no no weekend is the same, you know. And I'm always aware, even when I'm not working, I don't sit and moan about it. It's And, you know, it was so nice because last month they came and saw me do a Lenny Beige Cabaret at Crazy Cox. And it was so... It was properly beautiful to see them in the audience with my fiance and just loving it. And they'd never had the chance to do their Timmy and Matilda and other shows, but it was so beautiful to see me do cabaret. You know, and I'm swearing and I'm, you know, they saw my one man show as well. And that makes me the most proud where they can see me do my best work. And they're so proud of you. I, I remember them being at the, the opening night of uh, In Character when we were doing it at the, the Museum of Comedy. And just, it's really lovely to meet two, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm your friend, two really sorted, yeah, smart, they are. eloquent, gorgeous kids. They are. Uh, oh, because I meet other parents, other, other kids, and you go, your kids are pricks. You know, <laughs> they really are. It's like, wow. And I, yeah, I thank you. I mean, they really are a credit to us, you know. So, Steve, what were your... No, let's do a different one. Let's do... Steve, what do you do to relax when you have a hectic schedule? Oh, you know, it's all, it, I, my happy place is a, a room full of instruments. And I'm not like my... I've just know, walked uh, up your uh, stairs with yeah, all your guitars. On the wall. And, but it's, and I've got a piano upstairs and, and various instruments. And it, for me, the happy place is just noodling, as I call it. It's just sitting and noodling. And I don't have any designs to get on stage and do an album and release that like our mutual friend Matt. And it, it, but what I do, I, Cabaret has allowed me to play with some of the best musicians I've ever played with. And I count some of the greatest musicians in the country as my best friends, be it Guy Chambers or Leanne Carroll or whatever. And they will always come and do my shows. I'm ble- I mean, I really am. And I, have, I sound like a fucking lovey, but I am blessed at uh, world-class musicians playing with me. And I'm very musical and I... So although I don't have the ability to sit down and play piano like they do, my passion and my musicality allows them a home on my stage. And I, my, I, I'm, I, that's, my, that's how I relax. It's just, and I consume music constantly, constantly. Now, many will know you from two very, very large, very, very famous musicals, of course, playing Mr Wormwood yeah. in Matilda. But the other show was, of course, the, the ill-fated uh, Made in Dagenham. Tell me about Made in Dagenham. Tell me what that process was like. It's, it's pretty well documented. It was a difficult show for many people that were working on it. Mm-hmm. What was your experience? Well, my best, one of my best friends, David Arnold, who I was with last night, wrote it. And, um, and I, I, I still had to audition and I did the workshops. And, and it was one of those things, the, 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 the parts of it, David, Richard Bean, uh, Rupert Gould, it should have all been a done deal. But it was one of those, it never had an ending. It never had an ending that was absolutely definitive. And Gemma Arterton was brilliant and the cast were phenomenal and you Sophie Louise, uh, you know, Louise Dan, and it, there were amazing people in it, Mark Hadfield. But it felt that we were being looked after by... Uh, a company that had just done and lost a lot of money on um, uh, I Can Sing at the I Palladium. Can't I Can't Sing at the Palladium. Which seemed to be a, a, a musical that I enjoyed but was cursed by bad marketing. And ours, weirdly, was badly marketed, I felt. It didn't know what it was. It didn't know how to sell it. So you had a poster with these girls, the Essex girls who were on strike, and it seemed to be a kind of good girls' night out. It looked like girls' night out. And it, 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 it didn't know what it was. And it was, But I have to say, there were parts of it that I think were amazing. And then there were other parts that just didn't quite work. And I felt Rupert Gould as a 
director who's, you know, he's done some extraordinary work. It just didn't... It, I don't think he was comfortable... Doing a big West Ham musical is like steering a, 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 an oil tanker. It's, it takes a long time for it to turn around. And it just... He wasn't a comfortable captain. That was all. And... But it wasn't an unpleasant experience. And, you know, the people that came, were, they loved it. And, and it was, it had a heart and it was funny. And, but yet yeah, people didn't know what they were coming to see. And Matilda, you had the, what I think is a very difficult thing for an actor, which is to take over a substantial, well-loved character in Mr. Wormwood. Uh, from- Olivier Award winning from yeah. a, a rather extraordinary actor. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. And, and how did you find taking on a character and having to fulfil perhaps some of the previous footsteps that had been laid before you? Well, I, when I got the call to, do, to go for the audition, I, I, was, and I had to go and audition at nine o'clock on a Friday night in Clapham. And I remember arriving and hearing someone singing the song that I had to sing and just belting it out and thinking, well, that, fuck it, I, I can't sing like that. And I walked in and I didn't have my glasses on and I dropped my sheet music and I, and I, and I remember singing and I lost my train of thought and I was like, and I was like fuck, fuck, fuck. And um, it was one of the, you just had to, you know, I just thought it was the worst audition ever. And then, but I knew that as soon as I walked out of the, the room, Matthew Waters just went, that's oh, Mr. Wormwood. So you, you never, and I, I mean, I know that now. I mean, I didn't know at the time. But um, so I didn't want to see it, but I did see it just before I went in. And, uh, and But there's something about taking over a role where you can't, you can never make it completely your own. You still have to fit into a framework, which is why, you know, every year I get asked to audition for um, uh, Les Mis. And there's a part of me that goes, I don't really want to do it because you you, you are a pawn in a a well oiled chess game. You know you do you stand there, you do that, you do that. You can bring a little bit of your own character into it, but it, there's there's something about creating a role that's always going to be more attractive. However, um, that was difficult because I took over halfway through everybody else's year's contract, so I had to go in and be the husband to someone who'd lost her husband and she loved Paul and it took a while for me and Josie to really click as friends we were great friends now but so that was really weird it was it's it it felt a bit uncomfortable and it it can be quite lonely and then you know with Bertie and Bertie was so you know in his own world but was a joy to to be in a dressing room with and was very supportive. So it was, it, it, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag, you know, and, but th- the fact that that was the biggest show in town and it, it's, I don't think I'll ever be in a show like that again. And that the audience reaction every night just made it unique and slightly numbing because you just, I couldn't believe that I was in it. Hello. This is Kim Ismay, and you're listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats, and I hope you're having a wickedly interesting time. It's time for today's Show People platform, a springboard to give exposure to an artist that our listeners might not necessarily have heard of. And today is a composer who has regularly worked with us at Arian Productions. If you saw our shows passing by or as is, he was responsible for composing all of the music for those productions, as well as writing additional material for the world premiere of our production of The White Feather. Today's song is from About Bill, which was produced at the Landor Theatre London in November 2011, with music and lyrics by Matthew Strachan, and a book by Bernie Gorn. It's a one-woman musical about one man. Some of the ladies in this one-act show love Bill, others hate him, but all are touched by him. Bill infuriates, charms, redeems himself, then ruins it all as we follow him from 1930s Blackpool to 90s London. The show is written for and performed by Kim Ismay, and here she is, performing Foolish from About Bill. Fifteen bob a week, I told him, in advance... Every Friday, no messing. One bath a week. Hot supper, or once his show opens, cold cuts laid out. 
Knock me down half a crown, a little so and so. You're attractive to the younger man, foolish. You'll enjoy the thrill because you can, foolish. You're sure of his intentions for the night. You go about your business and he tiptoes out of sight. You're distinguished by experience, stupid. He worships your experience, stupid. Be sure to set your boundaries, taking care. And watch him slip across as if you'd never put him there. I don't fall, I'm too smart, unimpressed. Nothing's new, at least I thought there was nothing new to me. Fancy that, who'd have guessed? He took the top back next to the facilities. Liberties were taken, knocking me up late, dancing me round the kitchen. Up the stairs, to the top back. And then it starts, the girls. It's nothing to me, I says, just not under my roof, thank you very much. I shouldn't have cried. I never cry. He held me. He said, real soft, those youngsters can't hold a candle to you, Gloria. I warned him. He can change his ways or sling his hook. Hands on my hips. Inside I'm going, I'm yours, Bill. If you want me, please want me, Bill. You have to keep the upper hand. Useless. You showed a bugger, make a stand. Useless. You flash him your indifference if you dare. And watch him play the field as if he's keeping you for spare. I was cute, what a peach, sugar sweet. Then I blinked, you blink and more than a decade or two goes by. Here I am, well preserved, second best. Obsolete. Five minutes flat, his case is packed. He kisses me goodbye. The door slams. And that smile of his never wavers. You're attractive to the younger man. He worships your experience. I had to keep the upper hand Useless Stupid Foolish It's just the most wonderful, wonderful show and we are so thankful for the relationship that we've had with both Matthew and Bernie who wrote that song. Um, if you enjoyed that, and do please check out Matthew's enormous CV by visiting www.matthewstracken.co.uk and he also has many, many uh, albums of original songs and his musicals available on iTunes, Spotify and many other platforms. Please do check him out. Are you a composer or a songwriter that needs a platform? Then please write to me. I would love to play something as long as you have the broadcast rights and its original material. Please email info at arian-productions.com and we'll do our very best to feature you on the Show People podcast. Hi, I'm Alexis Gerard, and you're listening to the Show People podcast with the brilliant Andrew Keats. And I mean that, and not just because he slipped me a cheeky 20. Steve, you've told us about the upcoming film that you have. Can people see you in Cabaret anytime soon or Lenny Bay show? Do you know, I'm, I'm not... The, the, we, no. Well, no, actually, I'm hosting uh, something called Newly Night, number six. We've done it for six years. And the thing... Anthony Newley was, for me, my 
he became my hero, really, and my inspiration when I was doing Lenny Beige. And I'd done Lenny for about six months, and I was doing a gig at the Café Royal, as was on uh, Regent Street. And uh, Newley was... Pl- and I'd heard of Newley, but he was playing in the green room there, and m- the manager went, oh, you just come in at the back. These, there's only 60 people in there. And I remember I sat there, and I was just enthralled and needed to know more about him and then started to listen more and devour him. And I went, he is Lenny. He is what I want to base Lenny on. Um, so Newly was, uh, after seeing him, I just, I, I, I realised this was someone I wanted to incorporate into doing Lenny and I owed him a, a, a debt of gratitude. I really did. And so I, I created this show that was a series of letters written by Newly to Lenny Beige and... And I started singing his songs, and uh, but I realised that people didn't know who he was. They, it was an education for a lot of people. Like shit, he wrote Goldfinger, he wrote Feeling Good, he wrote Candyman, and I have, as part of the Newly Society and my dear friend Susan, who kind of keeps the Newly Flame alive, we do a show every year which just celebrates his life. And I now compare it as me. And we're doing, the. it will be the last one, and we're doing it the 21st of October at uh, Cafe Zadel at Crazy Cox. And it will feature um, a range of singers uh, interpreting newly songs. And it's a beautiful thing for charity. And it, it's just one of those shows that I, I love doing because I think he is going to be forgotten unfortunately and you know his shows were his songs were brilliant the shows kind of feel a little bit anachronistic which is why they're not usually performed but they were seminal and he influenced bowie and um he was he was an extraordinary man and uh, so that's the only live show i'm doing i think in the diary for a while i will be doing more lenny basings neil diamond and i want to do uh, more of the in character show, and I want to add a couple of characters to me my, too. Yes, yeah. Um, do be sure to check out the show notes, where of course I will do links to all of the things that Steve has coming up. Now, just before we get to our final challenge, uh, I have of course lovingly stolen a little format from Desert Island Discs, and of course worked my wizardry on it. So, Steve, I'd like you to imagine I have stranded you on tour in Whitley Bay. And you have to take with you your favourite things. What would be the album you would take? God, the album I that I would take. Would take yeah. Um, there's, you know what, there's one album. I, I, and I, it, my favourite song, and I always sing it as Lenny, is Spinning Wheel. And my favourite rap pack artiste, who was a, who sung most of Newly songs and had hits with them was Sammy Davis Jr. And there was one album that Sammy did when he was just into drugs and crazy, and he did one album for Tamla Motown, and and that would be that album. It, it, it's got just phenomenal versions of songs, and it just makes me very happy. And I just think you know Sammy's genius was extraordinary. Um, but yeah, God, one album—that's a really tricky one. Because you want to say I'm going to be a compilation with all my favourite bits on it, but probably that, I'd just, yeah. And what film? Being There. Wow, that was a quick answer. Yeah, well, it is my favourite film. Uh, Being There is a film that I, I, I come back to every year and it's the most beautiful. I'm a Peter Sellers obsessive and because that was his penultimate film and it was the film that he wanted to make for years and he used to write to Jersey Kaczynski and say, I want to, I want to be Chance and... Kaczynski went, you're a clown, you, you're, you're Cluzo. You, you, he didn't see the subtlety in what he did. And eventually he, he got the rights, they did it, and it was, it's, it's, a, it's a stunningly beautiful, underplayed, um, touching, timeless film that is, for me, it's perfection. So, yeah. And what would be the book? It's so weird. I'm not a voracious reader. I just, I love words and I think, yeah, I think I never get tired of reading a dictionary and that probably makes me sound like a wanker. No, not at all. But I remember years ago I was at a party and and Rafe Vines was there and it, it was quite a party party, you know, everyone was, and he was in the corner reading the dictionary and I just thought, oh, what a twat. Now <laughs> I go, yeah, I get it, I get it. And there's something about, you know, it. I, I, I'm constantly making... Uh, lists of words of new words to learn and 
I just I I just love word plays, you know, and that in my one man show it's all about every word has to be sacrosanct. So. And what would be the play? Probably Hamlet. Probably. I mean, it's quite a good play. It's quite good, yeah. It's and you're not such bad. a fan of new writing. You no, know, I went to Elsinore this year for the first time. Did you? And there was there were there was a group of actors, and they reenact scenes, and they're there all summer. And before I was walking through, and we, we were late. It was the last little performance they were doing, and we were late. Into you know, we were running up the the, the corridor, and this bloke went. <gasps> You're Steve first, aren't you? I went, and he was dressed in, and I didn't know. And he was, and then he was on stage, and he wrote to me afterwards. He tweeted me, and then we we, we exchanged emails. And I just thought, as a young actor, you're there with a group of other actors performing in English in Elsinore Castle. What an amazing gig! And it's it's, it's you know it's beautiful. And actually, I just saw the the um, Andrew. Um, what's his face? Andrew Scott. Scott one, and I just loved it. And I, I know, yeah, of course, I never get tired of seeing it. I like, I just love reinterpretations of stuff. I like, that's why I collect certain songs and versions of songs because I just think, you know, if it's a great thing, you can do it anyway. And I love that, love it. And what would be the musical? Matilda. Yeah, it really would be. I mean, I, I and. 600 shows, and I would stand uh, on the side of the stage and cry, not bawling my eyes out, but at, at certain songs and moments. And I just think Tim is a genius. And that's quiet. A, it's, a, it's a quiet. Yeah. That I mean, it song, is a, quiet, yeah. gosh. And I, it's, you know, I, I rarely use that word, but I truly believe what he did with that is, is and, and Guys and Dolls probably as well. I mean, Guys that's and Dolls probably the finest book of a musical ever written. Astonishing, yeah. And you can take a luxury item, anything you wish, what would it be? Guitar. Guitar. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself maybe getting a little bit stir-crazy, particularly in long-running shows? Oh, my God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you ever get tired of those really stupid questions that people ask when you have to do PR for a show? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you, <laughs> glad you said that, because uh, we've, you know, had quite a few profound questions and deep and meaningful questions. So, of course, to balance things out, yeah. because there is nothing worse Give me than... some flim-flam, Andrew. It's going to be flim-flam. I have collected a compendium of outrageous and, to be honest with you, quite frankly, pointless questions. You must answer as many of these questions within the next five minutes. Now, some of them are a little bit close to the bone, so you are allowed three passes. OK. Steve, first, let's play a game that I like to call Funny Five Minutes. Steve, first, how do you like your eggs in the morning? Uh, I, um, I boast I make the best scrambled eggs I've ever tasted. Um, are you an early riser or a night owl? Uh, both. What's the most delicious thing you can cook, other than the scrambled eggs? Um, a fish pie. Um, what do you think of Doctor Who? Uh, I have literally no interest in it. Do you think a swan could actually break someone's arm? No, but it could certainly, it, it could certainly bruise someone. Um, is line dancing cool? Yes. Excellent. Um, who is the most beautiful person you've ever kissed? My fiance. Sum up Donald Trump in one word. Cunt. Yeah, everyone says that. What's the best kids TV show? Pipkins. Look uh, it up. Sondheim or Lloyd Webber? Oh God, <laughs> really? I'm not even going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daddy or chips? Chips. Yeah, it's just always chips. Um, do you believe in ghosts? Mm, yes. Why do you say yes? I believe there's something. Have you seen a ghost? No. Fuck. I felt something. Um, what's your favourite swear word? Cunt. Yeah. I know. Um, what was your favourite thing to do when you were a teenager? Smoke. Uh, a, a, a smoke a spliff and go and see the the, the uh, laser show uh, at the planetarium. <laughs> um, what are the best kind of pants? Pants? Yeah. Oh, it's a it's it's a tight boxer brief. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Is it a pass? pass? That's a pass. Um, what was the last lie you told? 
I, you know what? I really, I thought you were amazing in that performance. <laughs> You've done it again, <laughs> dear. Um, do you believe in aliens? No. Have you ever pissed yourself on stage? <laughs> no. That's a lie, and you know it. <laughs> Steve, first, have you ever been arrested? No. Um, if you had to jump into a swimming pool filled with something, what would it be? Custard. If one song were to sum you up, what would that song be? Pass. That's a pass. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Oh, 100 duck-sized horses. Why? What's the logic of that? Just because it would be fun. Do you have a favourite Disney film? If so, what is it? (sighs) Yes, uh, the animated version of Robin Hood. Oh, love that. Love it. Um, What would be your last meal? A Zinger Tower burger from Kentucky Fried Chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Dirty. Um, If you had an autobiography, what would you call it? You've got better things to do with your time than read this. (laughs) Sweet or savoury? Sweet. Who was your teenage crush? Glynis Barber. And then I got to know her and I still couldn't look her in the eye because I was still so consumed by her beauty. What is the best gift you've ever received? <sighs> My children. Aww. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> yes. Two passes. That's not too bad. It's not too bad. Well, sadly, that music tells me that is all the time that we have left. But before we go, of course, I want to say a huge thank you to my special guest and friend for opening up his home and chatting nonsense with me for the past hour or so. So please go mad for the spectacular, the wonderful, Mr. Steve First. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, how can people keep up to date with what uh, you're up well, to? Well, my website, stevefirst.com, is the easiest way. Twitter, Steve First. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, that's it, really. Or phone my agent. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 raw. Well, just a few parish notices and that'll be the end. Make sure you've hit subscribe because my next guest, not only is she a musical theatre favourite, but she's probably one of my favourite women on the planet. She has just stepped off a plane after appearing as Madame Morrible in Wicked. And let's see if I can do uh, a CV in a minute. Um, also appeared in The Silver Gym, Not Going Out, Mamma Mia, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Hot Mikado, How the Other Half Lives, Noises Off, More Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Acorn Antique, Stepping Out, The Bill, Mamma Mia, Singing in the Rain, Sunday Night Fever. No, I can't do it. So, We'll probably kill her when it comes to the next episode, but my next guest is the wonderful Kim Ismay, and those who have worked in the business know what an absolute treasure she is. I cannot wait to catch up. Please remember, this podcast is produced by Arian Productions Limited. We are dedicated to giving opportunities to theatre makers. That's what we do. If you love the podcast and you want to support us, please take that two minutes and just send us a tenner, a fiver, 20 quid, a grand, whatever you can send, www.arian-productions.com slash donate. And please help us make a little bit of a difference and give more opportunities to great art forms. You can also help us by leaving an iTunes review as that really helps those wizards at Apple Um, already uh, we know our listener base is increasing because of some great reviews we've had come in do check those out on the UK iTunes lastly if you've got any comments ideas or things you'd like to send into the show you can reach me on Twitter at Andrew Keats you can send me an email to info at arian-productions.com or like that show people page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash show people podcast where you can find out the next episode things that listeners are talking about you even got your very own special area think of it as a sort of green room anyway from all of us at the show people podcast thank you for your support and remember just be better well that's always what i do in any interview i always i i you know uh, yeah there's nothing like pleasuring oneself (laughs)